the true story of female serial killer Eileen Warnos. She was able to break the myth that serial killers can only be men. She went on a murder spree that went on for a year. Eileen Carol Warnos, who is also known as Lee by her friends, was born on February 29, 1956 in Rochester, Michigan. In her first decade of her life, she believed that her grandparents, Lori and Britta Warnos, were her birth parents. She, along with her brother Keith, were the children of Lowry and Britta's daughter, Diane. When Diane was just 14 years old, she married Leo Pittman, who was 17 years old, in 1953. After 10 months, their first child was born named Keith. Pittman was determined to control his wife's life and was against Diane leaving the house while he was juggling his jobs. He worked as a gardener and also made chrome car bumpers. On the side, Pittman was a petty thief and soon escalated to more serious crimes. When he was arrested for auto theft, Pittman was given a choice between jail or enlisting in the army. He chose enlisting in the army and soon he left for basic training in 1955. While Pittman was serving his country, Diane, who at the time was expecting Eileen, filed for divorce. At the age of two, Eileen was abandoned by her mother, Diane Warnos. Eileen and her brother were left in the care of friends. Soon, their grandparents, Lowry and Britta Warnos, adopted them and rarely spoke of Diane. Leo Pittman never communicated with his daughter. The author of the book, Lethal Intent, Sue Russell, the grandparents portrayed as a decent and proper couple in their suburban community of Troy, Michigan. They were born from Finnish immigrants. Lowry was an auto worker and was a firm disciplinarian at home, which was a typical trait for fathers in the 1950s. Life for Eileen and Keith with their grandparents was a nightmare, especially for Eileen. She had suffered beatings from her grandfather. At the age of 14, Eileen Warnos became pregnant and rumors said that the father was a friend of her grandfather. She was soon kicked out of the family home and gave birth in a home for the unwed in Detroit. After giving birth, she left the child there for adoption. A year later, after the birth of her child at 15 years old, Eileen Warnos was accepted back into the family home. Eileen was already irritable before the pregnancy. Eileen accepted that she was going to live in a loveless home. She soon accepted and followed her grandparents' rules and regulations. However, persistent anger soon made her leave once more. Just after returning to high school in a few months, Warnos dropped out of school. Soon after, she was placed in a juvenile correctional facility. While she was detained, Warnos found out she was good at the game of pool. With that, she was able to use her skills in being a shrewd pool hustler. After her detention in Juvenile Hall, Eileen tried to return to the Warnos home, but after attempting to run multiple times, her grandfather forbade her to return. Eileen was homeless and had no money to survive. She sought to be a prostitute and became a thief to be able to survive. She slept in abandoned cars and left in the woods and spent her days hitchhiking, drinking, and using drugs. One of her neighbors, Jean Carr told author Sue Russell she was unloved, unwanted, and was always in the way, and I think it gave her one hell of a chip on her shoulder. As Eileen turned 18 years old, she did different kinds of crime like truancy, petty theft, and shoplifting to burglary and soon escalated to serious crimes with greater consequences. The author of Dead Ends, Michael Reynolds, had detailed and outlined the life of a violent troublemaker on her way to becoming a criminal. Warnos was apprehended by the police in Jefferson County, Colorado in 1974. Using an alias, she was charged with three charges, with disorderly conduct, driving under the influence, and firing a pistol from the window of a moving vehicle. After two years, she was arrested again by the Antrim County, Michigan Police. She was arrested for assaulting and disturbing the peace. She was also wanted for consuming alcohol in a vehicle and driving without a license. Eileen Warnos was detained on May 20, 1981, 
in connection with an armed robbery of a convenience store in Edgewater, Florida. She spent a year in prison in Florida as a result of that crime. After a year in prison, it was like nothing happened and soon Wernos was back to her criminal ways in 1984. She was arrested in 1984 as well for passing forged checks. She also had arrests for grand theft auto, illegal weapons possession, weapons theft, and multiple instances of assault and battery. Her police record was marked with all kinds of crimes by the 1980s. Wernos used different aliases to cover her tracks. Besides her crime, she also had a number of failed relationships with men. She married a wealthy man who was three times her age and later ended the relationship after a month. Wernos claimed that the old man would beat her with his cane. Wernos used the relationship as a way to earn quick cash for her to survive. During the spring of 1986, Wernos was finally able to find the love of her life. She met Tyria Jolene Moore at the Zodiac Bar in South Daytona. As documented in the book of Michael Reynolds' Dead Ends, Moore was a regular at the Zodiac. Moore had left her small religious hometown in pursuit of a more accepting community in Florida at 26. At the beginning of their first meeting, Wernos and Moore had hit it off immediately and they were inseparable ever since. To be able to keep a comfortable lifestyle of long-stay hotel rooms, booze, and drugs, Wernos increased her illegal doings, especially with Moore encouraging her. Wernos said in her trial, that's enough to rent a hotel for the whole week. We can party, hang out. It was love beyond imaginable. Earthly words cannot describe how I felt about Tyria. After lasting for three years, the spark in their relationship began to soon fade. Soon, they became just hard-living traveling companions. Moore would be given immunity from prosecution in exchange for her testimony to help convict Eileen. On November 30, 1989, Eileen Warnos killed for the first time. Her first victim was Richard Mallory, a 51-year-old owner of Palm Harbor, Florida TV repair business. He picked up Warnos near Daytona Beach. Based on Sue Russell, the author of Lethal Intent, Warnos and Mallory enjoyed some great discussion as they drove Mallory's 1977 Cadillac to Daytona Beach. As they were driving, Warnos admitted to Mallory that she was a prostitute, and if he could help her make some money. Mallory and Warnos came to an agreement price and soon drove off to a secluded wooded area. From there, Wernos shot Mallory four times. She took his ID and cash and then covered his body with a discarded piece of red carpet. She then also took Mallory's car home. She told her girlfriend, Ty, she has made a lot of money on the road and some guy even let her borrow his car. Details of what happened between Wernos and Mallory are still unknown, and Wernos claims she shot him in self-defense. Her next victim was David Spears, a 43-year-old construction worker. His body was discovered on June 1, 1990 in Citrus County, Florida. Spears was shot six times and his autopsy revealed that two shots were fired into his back, which indicated he tried to escape. Charles Cars Cadden, a 40-year-old highway worker and rodeo rider, was Eileen Wernos' next victim. He was shot nine times in the chest and stomach. Soon, another body was discovered, and it was the body of 50-year-old Troy Burris. He was shot twice in the chest. The next victim was a retired Air Force major and former Alabama police chief. Charles Dick Humphreys, 56, was found dead in Florida's Marion County on September 12, 1990. Peter Seams, a retired merchant marine, body never found. After leaving his Jupiter, Florida home for New Jersey, he disappeared. His 1988 Sunbird was found in June 1990. Eileen's last victim was a 62-year-old Walter Antonio. She shot him four times in the back and at the back of the head. Wernos' claims of self-defense were refuted in part by the location of Antonio's injuries. As Eileen Wernos' behavior became more and more erratic, Ty Moore became more concerned and uncomfortable. Moore became more and more suspicious 
with the items Warnos was bringing home for them to fence at pawn shops. There were electric razors, toolboxes, briefcases, guns, fishing gear, and watches, and it gave Moore an unnerving feeling. Moore grew suspicious of Wernos, but she could not even imagine what Eileen had been doing. There was a time when they wrecked a Pontiac Sunbird in Florida. Wernos was panicking and even warned Moore to run because the car they were using was a murdered man's car. Soon the law started coming down hard on Wernos' behavior. However, Moore did not want to be a part of it. She did not want to be an accessory to any of Wernos' crimes. In November 1990, Moore mentioned to Wernos that she would be leaving Florida to see her family in Ohio. However, by the time the authorities were already figuring out the seven murders and the serial killer, or pair of serial killers they were dealing with, police were quick to figure out they might be dealing with female serial killers. Sketches of the women soon appeared on local and national TV. Not long after Volusia County police traced items that belonged to Richard Mallory to a Central Florida pawn shop. The receipt of the stolen merchandise and Wernos's thumbprint. By January 9, 1991, Eileen Wernos was arrested at The Last, a bar in Port Orange. The police were not able to mention anything about the murder charges until they found Ty Moore, and due to Wernos's outstanding warrant for an earlier Colorado weapon charge. As written in Dead Ends, the investigators from Florida found Moore in Scranton, Pennsylvania. She was assured that she was not under arrest and she could tell the authorities about Wuornos' doings. Moore began to explain what Eileen Wuornos told her about killing Richard Mallory. She didn't want to believe Wuornos at first, but after the incident with the wrecked and stolen car, it raised her suspicions about Wuornos' behavior even more. Moore said she feared for her life and neglected to tell the authorities. Moore was convinced by the authorities to help them get a confession from Eileen Warnos. Soon, Moore wrote a letter to Warnos and requested her to call her at a nearby motel. Warnos called Moore from a prison phone on January 14, 1991. Investigators would be there to covertly record Moore and the calls. Moore was successful in getting Wuornos to admit to the killings. After 11 heated and emotional conversations spread over three days, Eileen Wuornos confessed at 10.14 a.m. on January 6, 1991 to Sergeant Bruce Munster and arresting officer Larry Horzeppa. They met in an interrogation room at the Marion County Jail. Throughout her trial, she declared self-defense for every murder act she executed. Her story was consistent. She said the victim had solicited her for sex and even attempted rape. Werno said she fired those shots to save her own life. As the case was presented by her defense attorneys, Wuornos was painted as a troubled woman with a borderline personality disorder and an IQ of 81. Doing the best they could, the defense was still unable to use Wuornos' mental state and capacity to save her from her sins and a death sentence. They portrayed her as a calculated, man-hating killer who was under the guise of being distressed and stranded, was able to lure seven innocent men to their deaths. With that, Wuornos received six death sentences. From Nick Broomfield's Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer, Eileen's final days in death row were filled with paranoia. She was able to proclaim her hatred for men the police and the court system while alternating between saying she killed in self-defense and denying it. On October 9, 2002 was the death sentence day of Eileen Wuornos. Her final statement, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back, like Independence Day with Jesus. June 6, just like the movie, big mothership and all, I'll be back. Eileen Warnos was the first woman to be profiled as a serial killer by the FBI. She became a constant fascination for media. Eileen Warnos was the subject of all news articles, tabloid TV programs, books, documentaries, and made-for-TV movies. A year later, her story was made into a dramatic film called Monster. It starred Charlize Theron. 
and was a spot-on portrayal of Warnos. Charlize Theron was able to garner a 2004 Academy Award for Best Actress. Thank you for watching today's video. Comment down below what you think of the doings of Eileen Wuornos and also hit the like button and subscribe button.